Welcome to Falcon's Ledge, I'm Ostringer, and today we're finally going to be doing our Winwing Orion 2 review. In this detailed exploration, we will delve into the intricate aspects of the Orion 2. We'll be focusing on the Orion 2 gimbal with the F16EX grip, with both the cam and spring gimbal as well as the FSSB gimbal. This review aims to provide you with a thorough understanding of the Orion 2's capabilities, strengths, and areas where it could potentially be improved. Whether you're a seasoned virtual pilot or just stepping into the captivating realm of flight simulation, join us as we navigate through the hardware, performance, features, and overall value offered by the Winwing Orion 2. From its versatile design to its tactile feedback and unique force sensing capabilities, this review aims to offer you insights that will help you to make an informed decision about integrating the Orion 2 into your flight simulation setup. There's a whole lot to go over with this one, so let's do this. Our journey into the Winwing Orion 2 begins with an exploration of its hardware. And a significant starting point would be the Orion 2 gimbal. Designed in a Warbird style, this twin cam gimbal is crafted entirely from metal, exhibiting the robust qualities of what appears to be cast steel. An impressive attribute of this gimbal is its user-friendly design. By merely removing these four screws and unplugging the USB cable, the entire gimbal can be extracted from its case. This ease of removal facilitates convenient servicing and adjustments. The value of this feature varies depending on your penchant for configuration changes and tinkering. For avid tinkerers like myself, this feature proves to be exceptionally beneficial, allowing for endless adjustments and experimentation. The dual cam design of the gimbal brings both advantages and drawbacks to the table. Foremost, this design ensures consistent resistance across the gimbal's throw when utilizing cams and springs. However, it's worth noting that other solutions employing a single cam come close to achieving the similar results. While there may be subtle differences, these disparities are often challenging to discern through intuitive feel alone. A minor drawback is noticeable with dual cam setups. They tend to have minimal resistance in the center, resulting in a somewhat loose feel within that region. While competitors like Verpal introduce a pretensioner to address the issue, in the case of the Orion 2, it is still noticeable. However, for most users, it probably won't bother you. Let's delve into the intricate design aspects of the Orion 2. Positioned underneath the gimbal center is a single 3D hall sensor. A closer examination reveals the presence of a magnet under the sensor, which is evident as I manipulate the gimbal's movement. The Orion's design is both symmetrical and highly customizable, offering users a range of configurations. A single set of cams and springs can be utilized on each axis. Additionally, you have the freedom to choose which side of the axis to mount the springs and cams on. Should you desire greater resistance, the option to purchase an additional set of springs and cams for both sides of each gimbal is available. This configuration presents an advantage in boosting resistance for use with extensions. Alternatively, you can opt for dampers on one side of each axis, or even employ two sets of dampers on each axis for extended helo-style setups where the stick remains in position you put it in. Personally, I lean towards spring-loaded self-centering gimbals with dampening and extensions for helicopter simulations and other center stick applications. The visual representation of this configuration appears as follows. This is a configuration with springs and cams. This is one with springs, cams, and dampers. And this is a configuration with dampers only. Concerning connectors, it's notable that the Orion 2 employs a connector similar to the Thrustmaster Warthog. However, the orientation for screwing the ends together is reversed. As a suggestion for improvement, Winwing should consider replacing the PS2 style connector with a more durable and user-friendly alternative such as a USB Type-C connector. Several key considerations arise when making configuration changes with the Orion 2. Firstly, if the included dampers are used as actual dampers rather than just solely holding the stick in place, greasing them becomes imperative. Neglecting this step will lead to a hitchy experience requiring effort to break the stick loose during each movement. 
While this aspect could have been better designed, akin to the clutch designs of VKB or Verpil, my respectful disagreement with another YouTuber revolves around greasing of clutches. Many companies already apply grease during the assembly process, and re-greasing them with specialized dampening grease or damping grease can significantly enhance the damper feel and performance. Properly greasing dampers can notably ameliorate hitching issues, a concern observed with both the Orion 2's stick and throttle gimbals, albeit for different reasons for each. Secondly, paying close attention to the pivot screws is essential. Ensuring that these screws are snug is critical, as loose screws can result in your axis drifting and centering issues. In my case, these screws were somewhat loose upon arrival from the factory, a discovery that I made during the installation of the FSSB unit. I would check these screws before use, especially if you have the FSSB unit. It is necessary to remove these screws in order to install or uninstall the damper kit, so if you plan on swapping back and forth at all, just make sure that they're tightened properly. Also, as a side note, these nuts for these screws are not retained. This is the biggest pain of swapping the dampers in and out. It would be really nice to have these retained. Moving on to the springs and cams kit. The kit, comprising of these components along with dampers, demands an additional $50 investment. Should you desire to employ two sets of cams and springs simultaneously for extensions, you'll need to allocate an additional $50. It's worth mentioning that many of the included cams might not offer the desired tactile feel. A notable drawback, in my perspective, is that the superior cams are exclusively available within this package, leaving me no other option than to order a set of cams and springs by default. Furthermore, the absence of dampers as a standard compounds this issue. This configuration shortcoming stands as a significant point of contention for the Orion 2. Competing brands provide cams, spring, and dampers within the base package, alongside a selection of better performing cams. Acknowledging the subjectivity involved with assessing different cam feels, this discrepancy still merits consideration. The default cams provided are of the no-center variety. Accompanied by relatively weak springs, this combination imparts a very floppy feel to the stick, which I found unsatisfactory during my experience. The no center cams contribute to the already prevalent loose feeling characteristic of dual cam designs. Preferences, of course, may vary, and some individuals might appreciate that floppy sensation. Ultimately, it's a matter of personal preference. Speaking of omissions in the package, though, the Z-axis compatibility comes at an additional cost of $79. In my judgment, I found this addition unnecessary, since I primarily plan to use this stick in DCS, and I have pedals, which led to my decision not to invest in it. For this segment, I recommend referring to WinWing's official YouTube channel for their recommended methods of installing cams and springs, but my preferred method of installing and uninstalling involves removing these two screws and gently pulling one of the cams off the stud. During this process, I maintain proximity to the stud with my Allen wrench to minimize the stress on the cam. Reinstallation involves sliding the first cam into position on the stud and then slightly stretching the spring and sliding the second cam over the opposing stud. After that, you just reinstall the two screws. However, it's important to note that this process should be approached with caution, and referring to the provided documentation for the official procedure is my recommendation. The dampers themselves embody simplicity in their design. A basic plastic clamp interfaces with a metal drum, which in turn connects to the primary axis pivots. Again, ensuring the snugness of the axis screw is pivotal, as it enables smooth rotation within the damper clamp. Employing the damper as a damper, rather than using it simply to hold the stick where it's put, like a helicopter, I recommend greasing it. This process is fairly straightforward. Just apply a thin layer of Niogel 767A onto the outside of the wheel before attaching the plastic clamp. Just fine-tune the screw adjustment until the desired damping effect is achieved, tailoring the experience to your preference. 
the extension component is characterized by its straightforward design as well. Essentially, it consists of an extension wire threaded through a precisely machined tube with attachments located on both ends. Remarkably, the construction of the extension garners my appreciation. A particular aspect I find commendable is the provision of a height adjustment. This feature addresses a limitation that I encountered with my VKB extension, where its height slightly exceeded the ideal height even with my sizable monster long mount. The adjustable nature of this extension facilitated a perfect position of the stick, allowing my wrist to rest comfortably on my leg during flight. It's noteworthy that many stick mounts tend to be excessively high. A departure from the typical configuration of real aircraft, while exceptions certainly exist, such a high mounting seems more of a Hollywood convention, facilitating nice-looking shots, including both the stick and the pilot, rather than a reflection of real-world setups or good ergonomics. I'm sure, again, there are exceptions. Nonetheless, if there is an area of contention I must highlight, it pertains to the flexibility of the cable. This particular cable lacks pliability, leading to instances where it gets pinched during adjustments, especially when operating at less than full extension, and even slightly sometimes at full extension. This pinching has resulted in the cable becoming caught within the clamp, yielding the following outcome. While the functionality of the cable remains intact, it begs consideration of potential alternatives that could have been used to address this pinching concern more effectively. Transitioning to the practical flight experience of the Orion 2, let's delve into the realm of using the spring and cam setup alongside dampers and the extension. I've opted to use the most robust springs provided in the spring and cam kit, and will be flying the AH-64 in DCS. Please overlook the scattered debris on the floor, that's remnants of my earlier tinkering with a falcon perch for JDAM, my Peregrine Falcon. Despite my initial expectations, the extension doesn't overly accentuate the center feel inherent in dual cam designs. The accuracy remains commendable. Allowing for precise micro adjustments, this leads me to highlight the extension's advantage in enabling me to position the stick exactly where my wrist can comfortably rest on against my thigh. This versatility becomes particularly apparent as my thigh dimensions have evolved since the initial acquisition of this stick. Overall, the spring and cam version of the gimbal performs as promised, suitable for users seeking this specific solution. Venturing into the realm of the FSSB, Force Sensing Stick Base, I was very excited to explore this piece of hardware upon its availability. Fortunately, I managed to acquire a lightly used unit from the secondary market. This particular FSSB hadn't undergone any extensive usage, providing for an ideal platform to subject it to thorough testing. Initial experiences seem to confirm for me the reasons why the FSSB modules aren't sold separately. This observation would eventually be justified through my own experiences. Following the instructional video provided by WinWing, I installed and configured the modules diligently. Calibration was performed through the SimApp Pro software, initially yielding satisfactory results. Yet, as usage progressed, a persistent issue emerged, primarily affecting the pitch axis, axis drift. Naturally, this development proved exceedingly frustrating. Seeking resolution, I began troubleshooting the software, hoping to pinpoint the solution. My investigation revealed that one of the main pivot screws was evidently off-center, and exerting pressure on the stick seemed to trigger greater movement than was expected. It's pertinent to clarify that these screws were not those manipulated during the damper installation process, but rather the ones near the cams and springs, which were not manipulated by me. As previously mentioned, these screws had come loose from the factory. Rectifying this, I securely fastened them, eradicating any play when pulling the stick. Following this correction, the FSSB performance aligned more closely with my initial expectations. The FSSB system comprises of two spring units and two force sensing units. Notably, the stick's movement detection still relies on the hull sensors at the base of the stick, while pressure sensors come into play when the stick engages them. 
This intriguing hybrid approach offers an element of authenticity by simulating the pressure engagement akin to the real plane's controls, although the real F-16's mechanics deviate slightly. This dual sensor approach contributes to a more authentic feel, and it's worth mentioning that the crossover between these two sensors can be customized to match user preferences. Shifting the focus to the FSSB experience, the contrast and feel is nothing short of striking. I have left no stone unturned in my exploration. I've experimented with every conceivable setting and adjustment. Force plus deflection mixing was tested extensively, and I've tinkered with both force only and deflection only configurations, which, by the way, I strongly advise against. It's quite unpleasant. I've introduced curves ranging from 0 to 30 in DCS across each configuration. Additionally, I have delved into the impact of using one or two spring plates on each axis. That's one on each side of every axis, by the way. The extensive period of reacquainting myself with the F-16 and building upon my existing knowledge has translated into many hours of flight time. While the process was arduous, both my personal skills and the content captured have flourished. The substantial stick time invested not only benefited my proficiency, but also will hopefully prove more valuable to you, the viewer, in the journey ahead. While using the FSSB with my settings, it has an extraordinary level of sensitivity. However, it's worth highlighting that this sensitivity doesn't trigger excessive pilot-induced oscillation. While it necessitates a bit of getting used to, especially for subtle adjustments, close formation flying and aerial refueling, a mere couple of fingers are sufficient to fly in many scenarios. For more vigorous maneuvers, engaging the force sensors requires more effort. This clip offers a glimpse of my initial connection and refueling attempt using FSSB. Admittedly, this endeavor consumed a considerable amount of time before bearing fruit, and even then, I was positioned too far forward and too high on the tanker. It's reassuring to note that my performance has improved since I recorded this, a testament to the learning curve involved. The primary challenge in refueling lay in the initial FSSB settings, which were less than ideal out of the box. However, through persistent adjustment, through experimentation, I managed to strike a favorable balance, leading to marked improvements. Speaking of settings, it's an opportune moment to delve right into those specifics. In order to do that, we'll go to the software. Wenwing deserves commendation for their software, which, despite some imperfections, stands as one of the finest I've encountered for flight sticks. Curiously, the visual presentation holds a particular appeal to me, making the software remarkably engaging. Well, not a necessity, this user interface resonates positively with my preferences. What truly shines is the software's remarkable intuitiveness, simplifying the configuration process. Allow me to delve into the settings I personally apply to the FSSB to optimize its performance. Feel free to experiment with these settings to find the configuration that aligns best with your preferences. The foremost alteration that I made, which applies to both the FSSB and the spring and cam variants on the VR Island 2, involves reducing or eliminating the dead zone that comes pre-configured. When combined with the inherent center looseness typical of dual cam gimbals, the 4% factory set dead zone contributes to an overly numb center on a fairly high-end stick. While this point has been echoed before, my quest for refinement led me to discover that this dead zone substantially influences the aircraft's handling, particularly when using the FSSB. Just to note, recalibration is required when transitioning between spring and cam and FSSB configurations. Here is how to recalibrate the FSSB. After you've accessed the MFSSB config options, you'll encounter three configuration choices. Force plus deflection, force only, and deflection only. Within the MFSSB system, two sensors play a role, the deflection sensor represented by the 3D hull sensor beneath the access center, and the force sensors. The system harnesses both sensors, the deflection sensor gauges stick movement, and the force sensor measures the exerted pressure after engaging with the force sensors. 
opting for the force only setting is ill-advised, resulting in a noticeable dead zone at the center due to the initial lack of contact between the axis bearings and the force sensors. Such a configuration would render flying awkward and cumbersome because you would lack fine movement in the center. Although there might be a way to create an initial contact through precision fitted shims or something like that. Making these yourself might cause issues though, unless they were precise, as it's a pretty tight fit. So all in all, not recommended. Deflection only mode is often considered realistic mode, ostensibly mirroring the F-16's confined stick movement. However, this mode solely relies on the hull sensor, omitting the force sensing elements altogether. Personally, I consider adopting this mode with FSSB an inefficient allocation of your financial resources considering you just spent extra on the FSSB for its force sensors, right? Rather than defaulting to this mode, it's more advisable to fine-tune the DCS curves with your spring and cam, mirroring the movement of the F-16 stick. Maybe some will prefer this mode? If that's you, hey, more power to you. Finally, the mode I use personally and also recommend is the deflection plus force mode. This mode allows you to customize the percentage of the stick throw covered by deflection to illustrate a 0% setting mimics the force only mode. And after extensive experimentation, I've settled on a 30% deflection coverage. Although I occasionally toggle between 25 and 35%, I'm still tinkering as always. After adjusting these parameters in SimApp Pro, I further introduced a 10% curve in DCS for both pitch and roll axes. Minor modifications could be made to the pitch curve as it seems to have more authority compared to the roll axis. My intention is for these tailored settings to serve as a foundation for your MFSSB optimization. In the future, I plan to create a YouTube short solely dedicated to these settings, facilitating a quick reference for users seeking refinement. In each review, it's essential to assess the strengths and weaknesses of a product, as even exceptional offerings have room for improvement. Starting with an optimistic note, let's delve into the pros. Number one, it's versatility. The Orion 2 stick showcases an exceptional degree of versatility, a characteristic that I find myself repeatedly drawn to in various devices. This stick adapts seamlessly to a multitude of aircraft. For instance, during my flight with the AH-64 Apache, the performance was commendable. While I've always held a preference to the specific grip of the F-16, its replica value truly shines when used with an F-16 or A-10. Additionally, by switching to different grips, you can effortlessly cater to aircraft like the F-18 or F-15. Number two, quality. The craftsmanship exhibited in this grip, gimbal, and the internal components varies from good to excellent, contingent upon your point of view. The tactile experience of the components that you interact with is definitely superb. These parts feature satisfying textures and predominantly consist of metal, a material highly favored by many users. The hat switches stand out as some of the most responsive on the market, their ideal squishiness, and then all the way up to where they have a nice tactile feel upon activation makes for an excellent combination. While they might have slightly longer throw than my personal preference, they are a commendable addition. The trigger exhibits a robust detent, contributing to the gratifying user experience as you go through the first and second detents. If there is an interface that stands out as being worse than others, I would have to say that the buttons don't have that same tactile satisfaction on activation that the hat or trigger have. Number three, price. When considering the base costs of this product, it's challenging to find a competitor that can outmatch it, provided you're content with excluding additional cams, springs, and the Z-axis. Now transitioning to the cons. Intriguingly, there is a common theme that appears in both sections, and this is a first for this channel. Number one is going to be the price. The pricing factor warrants scrutiny in both the pros and the cons section. Charging $50 for an extra bundle of springs, cams, and a pair of subpar dampers registers an excessive expense, if you ask me. And if you want to use an extension, you'll want two sets of springs and cam. So you've got to spend $100 extra to get both of those. 
In addition, for that price, it would be nice for a decent set of dampers to be included. Comparatively, competitors include these supplementary elements with their products included in their base price, and their base price isn't that much more. Furthermore, a $79 price tag for a Z-axis raises my eyebrows. While a Z-axis might not align with every user's needs, its steep pricing seems disproportionate and maybe cost prohibitive. Although this aspect isn't a deal breaker, it's worth highlighting as a noteworthy concern, especially for individuals who share my aversion to what kind of feels like nickel and diming. Number two, quality and quality assurance. Regrettably, my unit arrived with two loose screws, a seemingly minor issue that had significant repercussions. Initially, I overlooked this during my initial inspection and testing. It wasn't until I encountered a major problem with the FSSB that I traced the source back to these loose screws. Others have also reported QA issues with Windwing products, but these are not issues that I've experienced and at least in the devices I've tested, don't appear to be a design issue. So I can't report on those issues, but it's something to keep in mind when purchasing. In conclusion, the Windwing Orion 2 offers a comprehensive and versatile solution for flight simulation enthusiasts, particularly those interested in military aircraft like the F-16 and A-10. The quality of materials used in this grip, gimbal, and internals are commendable, providing a tactile and immersive experience during flight. The grip's textured surface, well-designed buttons, and strong trigger detent contribute to its overall positive feel. The Orion 2's versatility stands out as a significant advantage, allowing users to configure it for various aircraft types. Its compatibility with different grips opens up the possibility of replicating controls for a range of aircraft, which is a considerable asset for users who enjoy flying a whole bunch of different planes. However, the pricing strategy is a double-edged sword. While the base cost of an Orion 2 is very competitive and offers good value for its quality and features, the additional expenses for optional extras such as spring and cam kits and the Z-axis attachment can be off-putting. This pricing approach can lead to a sense of nickel and diming, particularly when compared to competitors who include similar accessories as part of the package. Furthermore, quality control issues are worth noting. Reports of loose screws and other minor manufacturing defects raises questions about the consistency and build quality across units. These issues can have a tangible impact on your performance. In terms of performance, the Orion 2 provides a satisfactory experience with its default spring and cam configuration, though some users may find the dual cam design results in a somewhat loose feeling in the center. The additional dampers can help mitigate this to some extent, but users should be prepared to grease and adjust them before optimal performance. The FSSB module, while adding a unique force sensing aspect to the stick, requires careful calibration and adjustment to suit individual preferences. It offers a different feel compared to traditional spring and cam configurations, offering sensitive control and center while requiring more force for larger movements. The learning curve associated with the FSSB can be significant, but but with time and experimentation, it can provide a satisfying level of realism and control. Overall, the Winwing 2 is a versatile, high-quality simulation control solution that caters to a wide range of preferences and aircraft types. While there are some pricing and quality concern issues, its strong performance, tactile feel, and customization options make it a worthy consideration for serious flights and enthusiasts. So, should you buy the Winwing Orion 2 F16EX stick? Well, if you're in the market for a replica stick, I think Winwing really has a winner on its hands here, especially if you're a Viper jock and you really want some of that FSSB lovin'. Before we wrap things up, I'd like to share a personal update. I've recently embarked on a new adventure in the world of aviation by joining a virtual squadron in DCS. This marks my inaugural experience with such a group, and I am thrilled to be a part of it. All Services Air Warfare, or ASAW, is an excellent virtual air wing, combining regular training experiences and deployments with a relaxed yet friendly atmosphere. If this kind of community resonates with you, I encourage you to consider joining. Check out the link in the video description for more details. I'd like to express my heartfelt gratitude to two generous individuals from ASAW who made contributions that significantly aided my channel's progress. First, a big thank you to Slimy. 
longtime friend of mine who donated the A10C module. And secondly, a sincere thank you to Orco for donating the Nevada and Sinai maps. A special shout out to Rip from ASA for creating a skin featuring my YouTube logo. Your creativity is truly appreciated. Your contributions will undoubtedly enhance the content we create in the future, and I can't wait to showcase them in upcoming videos. I sincerely hope you found value in this video. Crafting it demanded an extensive investment of my time and effort, and I'm pleased to have the opportunity to share my insights with you. If you enjoyed the content and you want to support the channel, please consider subscribing. It truly means a lot to me. For those who want to contribute more, you can explore options like Patreon in the description or reach out to me directly if you want to discuss additional possibilities. Your engagement and viewership are a cornerstone of my channel, and I am sincerely thankful for your participation. As we conclude, remember to fly safely, have fun, and as always, have a nice day.